as a young kid, I'll go back to 16. Uh, and it could probably go back a little bit earlier. My first story as far as around money that I remember is I wanted a remote control car, but not just any remote control car. It's like $200. So with inflation of today's rate, that's probably like a Bitcoin and, you know, <laughs> I don't know, $5,000 or something like that now. Uh, so my parents were like, nah. Well, they said I can have the car, but they'll go half. And uh, I remember I had to like do all kinds of chores and save up. So, and I was just, and I always, I think I get it from my mom. I was super stubborn about getting what I want with money being a tool to get it. So that's like my first money memory. And then at age 16 is like when I opened up a savings account with the help of my parents. And once again, I was, you know, they said, do you got McDonald's money? Cause I wanted a car. You see the cars just get bigger. You know, so this time it was a, a six, two, six Mazda that I wanted. And there, once again, they were like, we'll go half. And ironically, I had forgotten about the remote control story until now. So I should have saw the pattern, <laughs> but saved up. They, uh, I got my first job working at a movie theater and my parents debate me on this. I don't feel like we really talked about money they told me this is our money and that's your money and you you know hands off our money but i don't feel like we had money conversation and yet they were always really good with money i did not like want for anything so we were well off as far as the family goes but i feel like my money lessons really came from trials tribulations and mistakes later in life well let's dig into some of those like lessons learned later in life so i guess like how far do you go before you start making some of those mistakes like do you do you start making those in college or do you kind of have your head on head on your shoulders pretty well for a while and then kind of fall off the wagon? No, I, I got a, a good leaping head start at age 18. It was prom and I was either the only one or the only willing one to have a, a card that they could put on file. And so I got the block of rooms for all the friends. And this is, this predates cash app. So I had to go around and like run up on people like Debo, like, yo, you got my money for this prom, man? Cause they go, they go hit this card. I had to like threaten people. I was like, look, don't break nothing in this room. I don't care what happens tonight. Nothing gets broken on this room because it's all going to be on my car. I still feel like it came up short. I made a reel recently about how everybody gives you cash but no gratuity. I still feel like somehow it came up short. And I had actually saved up a few thousand dollars. Um, so it's an interesting story. I, I, I was more responsible with money from like 16 to 18 than I was from 18 to 25. So I'd saved up thousands of dollars. I'd, I'd gone half with my parents on that car now. And then I like spent it all on that prom night. So I, <laughs> my, uh, the boss that I actually worked for at, at IHOP, my parents refused. They're, they're, they're also a consistent pattern here. I was like, yo, I need a rental car. They're like, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> And my boss was like, yo, I got you. And so I rented a Miata as I'm flying around the, the mean streets of Austin, Texas in my little drop top Miata. And um, I got this block of rooms. And I just remember like all the money was gone roughly soon thereafter. <laughs> and I learned nothing. But it, it was a weird story because I think I falsely thought how easy it was to accrue money. Uh, so I'm like, I got thousands of dollars and it didn't seem that difficult to do so. But it's because I had no bills and no financial obligations. So prom night was my first money mistake that I at least remember. And so you said you got worse from 18 to 25. I got to ask about that, man. What started happening then? So that that's actually what led to the book. I started living the life. Uh, I wrote a book called Debt Free or Die Trying, How I Buried Myself $30,000 in Debt and Dug My Way Out. And that came out in 2016 and the second edition came out in 2020. And that I started living that life at 22, graduated school with $9,000 in debt, which I thought was pretty good, relatively speaking to what my friends had, which was multiple tens of thousands of dollars in debt. So I was like, you know, I was keeping the opposite of keeping up with the Joneses. I thought I did pretty well. And then I got an offer for a consolidation loan, which at that time would just look like pretty marketing to me. They're like one low consolidation payment. I was like, oh man, this is a great deal. And uh, they sent me this consolidation loan. And I thought they were going to pay off. It was three credit cards. I thought they were going to pay it off for me and I'd start making my low monthly payments. Instead, I got this check in the mail, I'm 22 years old, never made more than $9 an hour for $10,000. And I was like, hmm, I could pay off all these debts or, and I chose option B. Uh, went out, got a new car. You see a pattern here. I got another car. Uh, this one has the biggest rims that I had to date at that time. Anyway, I think there were 17s. <laughs> I eventually got 22s and, um, spent $13,000 on the car. And, and I was talking to my father about this. Didn't negotiate. I like walked on the lot. I'm like that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
dealer, you know, I, I think I made his Christmas bonus. He was like, hey, here you go. Signs of paper. Where we good? And uh, actually, I, I, should, I should be fair. That dealer was actually very nice to me. He walked me down. It was a small town. It's Huntsville, Texas, for those of you who aren't from Texas. He walked me down to the credit union. Now, mind you, they might have been, like, clapping hands in the back room and everything like that. Got my little credit union deal uh, signed. And then by the end of that weekend, I had started off with $9,000 in debt. I had $26,000 in debt. So, yeah, I, I level up. You know, I, I go big, go home. And what kind of work are you doing at this time? Like, what does the, the cash income look like at this time? That is an excellent question. I used to work at a library, <laughs> at the college campus library. Um, honestly, I don't know what I did. And obviously, it must not have been a lot. I remember, like, some fish sheets. I think I was, like, a, a student worker. I was, supposed, I was supposed to help students, but usually I just ignored them and pointed them towards the copy, copy room. Then I got a, my first job at a main main job, Office Depot. But my first job post college graduation, I did data entry and made nineteen thousand dollars, nineteen thousand six hundred dollars. Oof, I was a little little over leveraged. <laughs> Just a little bit there. <laughs> so this is twenty two though when you bought this seventeen inch seventeen inch rim car, right? That's correct. Okay, so at that point, you're twenty six thousand dollars in debt. You're making nineteen thousand six hundred dollars a year. What do the next Before couple of years look like? <laughs> <laughs> so you would think that I would have like learned my lesson. I wish I could tell the listening audience, like, oh, I got my life together, and that was that, paid that off. It didn't quite go that way because I still had in my mind, I thought you went to school to get rich. Uh, so I got a degree in business, and I was just like, oh, there's been a mistake in the matrix. I'll be knocking down six figures, you know, no problem here. Uh, it, it took me... 18 more years before I, I hit, if I'm doing that, that math, eight more years, I think it was 30 before I hit that six figure mark. And so, you know, I had to, I had to change, but I, I really didn't change until I hit what I talk about in the book is rock bottom. And that was actually age 27. So I'm actually $30,000 in debt. Then uh, I added a $3,000 TV to the, to the $26,000. It, it was, well, at that time it was a big TV. It was 42 inches. At that time it was huge. <laughs> now I, I, I think it's like the smallest TV in our house. I think we got one hanging on the fridge. It's 42 inches. Um, but it took a few more years. I'm still not making six figures. I'm actually working three jobs to make ends meet from all that debt that I accrued. I worked at AT&T selling iPhones, previously Singular, because that's how old I am. So AT&T got uh, AT&T bought out Singular. Uh, I was putting cell phones, excuse me, computers together part time at Dell, and I had a full time job uh, making fifty thousand dollars an hour or fifty thousand dollars. I was like, whoa! I wish. Wait, wait, wait. And I still couldn't make ends meet. And I remember I missed a payment. I believe it was a Discover card. And I think it was a Discover card I had from college you know, when I had, I got uh, all these cards for a yo-yo. So I traded my soul for a yo-yo. And I remember I was going to have to apply for another consolidation loan. And they're not coming in as frequently anymore because, you know, my credit is bad. My, I'm over leveraged. They're like, ah, this guy makes 19600 He just took a $20,000 loan out. Obviously, we can't trust him. And I just recall, like, if I did not get this consolidation loan, the only thing I knew le next was bankruptcy. And that was like my rock bottom night. That was age 27. And so after you're having that moment, like, what are the first thoughts that go through your mind as far as like what you can do? Did it really like light a fire or were you just woke up the next day, cold turkey, started making huge changes? Or was it like, let me make a little bit of change, just get my head above water and then kind of stay there? I think the first question, and I think a lot of people that either are in debt or have gotten themselves into debt, is how did it get here? Uh, so now, of course, I can look back in hindsight and laugh and reflect over you know, 12, 18 years, and, and I'm like, oh, man, that's a, that's a funny story. But at the time, it, it, it just seemed like it happened overnight, even though that was a five-year span. It, I'm like, how did it get this bad? How did it get this bad? How did it get to a point where I can't pay my own bills, you know, where I, I reach rock bottom? So there was a little bit of self-wallowing and pity. And I, I learned years later, I wish I had knew these tools now, um, as a mentor that told me, he's like, you know, no matter what happens, you just give yourself 24 hours, you know, drink, curse, point fingers, you know, whatever, do whatever you have to do. Um, but that's all I'm going to give you is 24 hours to feel sorry for yourself. And then you have to come up with a plan. Uh, so I, I wallowed a little bit longer because I didn't have those coping skills at that time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I do recall, I was like, I'll never put myself in this position again. And I went to a source that's still out there, uh, bankrate.com slash calculators with a S. 
And I think if I recall correctly, I went to Yahoo to get there. So I'm trying to, you know, show people, you know, you know, earn my stripes and, and maybe even some rings. If we're talking about trees, like I went to yahoo.com to get the bank rate. I was like, how do you get out of debt? <laughs> they sent me the bank rate and I printed out, um, a PDF of the plan. that would ultimately be the system that I would use to get out of debt. On the income front, I know you mentioned you were making $50,000 a year. You also have two part-time jobs. So just to paint a fuller picture, because there are people who, like you, Marcus, they get in the situation, they're in you know, $30,000 of debt, more or less, whatever their specific situation might be. They don't know how they got there. Their income has been steadily increasing since they got out of the college, like you. I mean, from 19.6 to 50 plus is a pretty big jump. Like You're probably 3Xing your salary, your, your total income at that point. Where were these other kind of lifestyle inflationary things coming into play? Like, what did your personal financial picture look like at that point when you were starting to make all those changes and build that plan? So it was a great question. I know one of the main changes was when I made 19,000, I was living in Huntsville, Texas, which I think is like a population of 18,000. And 19,000 is probably about the median uh, salary out there. Uh, I won't go further into that. I, I, I don't know how many Huntsville, <laughs> Texas listeners you have. <laughs> um, but I moved to Austin and I got a job at 30,000. And so Justin's in Austin. So he knows 30,000 doesn't stretch too far in Austin, Texas. And Austin, Texas, it wouldn't surprise me, is 10 times more expensive than Huntsville. So I didn't 10 up. 10 X, my, my salary grew, but also my lifestyle grew. So I'm in Austin, Texas. And I remember I had to, um, I got to get a roommate. I went back to a, we're still good friends now, but I went to a friend. I was like, look, man, I can barely make ends meet. I need someone to go half with me on a roommate. I got to pay off this car with these 17 inch rims. You know, I'm working three jobs. I, I, I got to struggle to make it work. So, um, you know, the salary was going up, but so were all the expenses around that. And I know it was 27 because I ended up not having to, but kind of back to the wall, not too many choices. I had to accept a job in Denver because they, they offered me more money. They offered me a 40% increase to 70,000 and briefly pivot to tell that story. I probably could have got more money. Like I had nothing to, I had no idea around salary negotiation and I had watched a movie once and the guy was like, yeah, I make 70,000. I remember everybody was impressed. So I was like, uh, 70,000. They're like, okay. <laughs> they, they didn't even stutter. They didn't even stutter to this day. I wonder how much I could have asked for. <laughs> and so always negotiate your salary, but do it with more informed than the movie that you watched sometime in high school. And, and so I have talked a lot about it's important to, you know, X your salary or you can cut your in, in expenses. And I was by that point, by the time I got to Denver, I was living pretty bare bones. I was I was shaving my own head. Like when I met the fiance uh, the first time I was shaving my own head to, to save money. I, I was the home lunches. I was like I was the latte factor before the latte factor was written. I'm like I'm making coffee at home. I was like that guy. And even then I still had to make I had to grow my income to really get that gap between my income and my expenses so I could pay down this debt. Well, one thing you mentioned earlier was about like your credit score was really bad. You were kind of thinking about maybe bankruptcy. I'm curious, like some of the lessons that you learned to help rebuild that credit, but also I don't know if you can remember things that maybe you thought were important to build credit that you later realized were just like these fallacies that are out there. Actually I have to, and this is part of the story. I have to assume my credit was bad because of that. I was not responsibly managing my credit. And I phrase it that way because I didn't know my credit score. When we had that conversation, the uh, when I was trying to get this consolidation loan, that was one of the questions he asked me. He said, what is your, your credit score? What is your total outstanding debt? What is your credit utilization? And I just couldn't answer the question. I, I had never heard these questions in my life. I was 27 years old and I didn't know what my credit score was. Uh, I didn't know how much total debt I had. I didn't even know how much debt I had to pay each month, but I had, and Discover Card might debate this, <laughs> but <laughs> I, to this day, I swear I never got the bill because I had never missed a bill payment in all my life. I took great pride in at least making the minimum payment. Like I, they, they'll get, they'll at least get the minimum payment from me. And I missed the minimum payment once because I didn't get the bill. And this, uh, the the next bill was twenty nine point nine 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 percent APR. And because I had so much debt on that, I was like, I can't even make this minimum payment. And I was like, you know what? It's a little, a little administrative error. I'm gonna call up my boys at Discover because you know I've been rocking with them for like seven years. We gonna work this out. And I was like, ha ha, Discover, yo, what's going on, man? My interest rate was like nine percent last week, and now it's twenty nine point nine percent. What are we gonna do about this? They're like, you're gonna pay the bill. 
<laughs> and I tell that story because I made a mistake uh, at that time. My the, the missus doesn't be, believe me, but I used to be emotional. And so <laughs> I was like, you know what? Close the car. Close the car. Discover, you know, I'm going to Bank of America, you know. <laughs> and so I messed up my utilization rate. And, you know, it's like 30 percent of your credit score. I closed that car. And I was like, I'm sticking it to Discover. Screwed myself in the process. And so really... Most of my lessons that I talk about now is through trial and tribulation, trial, tribulations, trials, tribulations and mistakes. So having gone through all the mistakes, I, I might not know all the right answers. But I can tell you all the wrong. So as we continue through your journey, at what point did you kind of make? So it sounds like through most of this, unless we've kind of missed any parts, you're like 27 right now in the story. Um, most of your income has been through working for someone else. You had like the job at IHOP. You had a job at like Office Depot. You had all these different jobs where you're kind of working for the quote unquote man. But I know at some point that turns into some kind of entrepreneurship. When was that first spark lit? I would actually say it was by accident and it would have been 2016. And at that time, I feel like we're OGs in the game. We started podcasting. I actually think of the first time we started podcasting was 2013. We weren't very good at it, so I'm not going to say that show, and hopefully it's been deleted. Uh, but 2016, we released a good podcast and started generating some income. So we're like, oh, maybe we should create a business around this. Uh, and did that for four years and ultimately ended up, I enjoyed it, liked it. Um, and you can kind of do the timeline here. Start it. I can just look at life now as pre and post pandemic. So this is all pre pandemic. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I had left that business, ended up selling my stake and uh, kind of, you know, senior geriatric millennial, where's life going? What is the purpose? You know, I'm locked down in this pandemic, you know, the great resignation up, is up on us. What do we do? And I was like, you know, I really enjoyed running my own business. I really enjoyed podcasts. I really enjoyed doing that. I had found my purpose accidentally and, and money was more a ancillary benefit that came from um, finding and doing my purpose and walking in my purpose. So how does the guy who has, you know, the $30,000 in debt, doesn't know their credit score, making all these mistakes to feeling so confident that you have something to offer in the money space, you're going to start podcasting, you're going to write books. Like what was that transition? Like, was it, you just realized, Hey, I've messed up a lot and I'm talking to friends and they enjoy what I got to say. So maybe I take it to the next level. Like what did that transition look like? Yes. W one thing that's been strange about me is uh, my brother-in-law says I have forced got my way through life is I don't really think about the circumstance for failure. I just kind of try things. So before I started the podcast, I'd been writing um, for like 10 or 15 years and ultimately got into freelance writing. But I just start doing things that interest me that tend to stumble into paid opportunity. So uh, I was over there writing on MySpace and somebody's like, hey, you should start a blog. I'm like, a what? They're like, you know, <laughs> you go to WordPress and you can blog. I'm like, all right, you say so. So I started up uh, writing under my own name. Uh, that actually did pretty well because I, I don't. I think every time I hit publish, it'll be the last time. It's everything's going to fail. No one's going to download it. So I don't really worry about <laughs> what, what comes of it and good things have come from it. Uh, so same thing with the podcast. Uh, pre pandemic, I was, I had stopped writing at that time and a friend reached back out and they were like, Hey, uh, I thought you had some interesting blogs. Do you want a podcast? I'm like, what the hell's a podcast? You're like, I just, <laughs> sure. Whatever. Uh, I showed up with the mic that I used to use at Yahoo. I am. And, and, and that's why I hope nobody finds that episode and recorded a podcast and ultimately started winning awards. It's just like, yeah. I found things that are interesting to me and I just like to explore hobbies. I'm a, I'm a hobby starter um, that I actually am very interested in the journey of creating things. That's, it's actually like a flaw that I've learned about myself later on. Cause once it's finished and like up and pretty and polished and everybody's like a plus, I'm like, eh, I'll move on to the next thing. So it's actually staying focused and purposeful. And uh, I'll kind of end the, the question with this uh, now. And some of this, again, is the existential crisis of being of the, the geriatric millennial age that I am. Um, I'm watching these motivational videos now. Evan Carmichael, if you want to look at it. So you can subscribe to his list and he emails you a motivational video every morning. And I got this from Tanya Rapley. It's not even my own idea. And she's like, you know, I, was, I, I watch a motivational movie, a video every morning. I think that's corny. I still think it's corny and I'm doing it. 
But then I look at my mornings and I wake up and I, I jump on Twitter and people are yelling and the world's on fire and I jump on Facebook and you know, it's a little bit slower, but the world's still on fire over there. And but before I get to my morning coffee, I'm exhausted. Yeah, I'm like, damn, the world's on fire. And I was like, maybe I should try this motivational video thing. And I watched one this morning and it's always like a business leader. There's two minutes. And he said, just do it. They're like, what is the key to how you have become a multimillionaire billionaire? He's like, I'm not being there's no animosity to my response to your question. I do things. That is what separates me from my business leaders who are not where I am. I see something I want to do and I do it and I fail and I learn from the failure and then I level up and I level up and I level up. So then I'm sorry. Sometimes that's not the answer people want to hear. I just do things and the things that work, I keep doing. So motivation, would you say that most of the things you're trying, you're not even thinking about money? Is that 100% true? You're just doing them for the love of the craft? Or do you go in knowing that, okay, I kind of like doing this thing. There is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel where this could be profitable. So I know for me, when I'm thinking about a new opportunity, like money is at the forefront. It might might be a flaw in my character. I'm not exactly sure. But usually I'm not just doing things for the pure joy of doing them. And then all of a sudden I make a bunch of money from doing that thing. Uh, I'll share a quote. It's actually my father that told it to me to answer the question. He said, use your 20s to learn, your 30s to apply, your 40s to teach and mentor. So the answer to your question is yes, in my 20s and 30s. I just did things that I enjoyed. I I didn't really care what the outcome was. I had a pretty decent paying job. I had a nine to five. Uh, and so I didn't have to, I had the luxury of not really worrying about money either because I was leveling up my income. I increased my income. So from that 40%, from that 19,000, I then went on to increase it 360, 360% because I increased my income 400% when it was all said and done. And there's an article about that on Yahoo Finance. Um, and so I was leveling up my day job income. So I didn't, these other things I could choose to do as hobbies. Now that has changed that I do less hobbies if I don't see a monetary gain to them. But some of that is just because I don't have the luxury of time to just kind of do whatever. I don't have the luxury of time to just write a 2000 word blog and hope somebody reads it like I could when I was in my 20s. So I tell people, you know, use your 20s as a time of exploration. I feel like a lot of 20 years feel like they got to have it all figured out. And I'm like, use your 20s. I use that as a time of exploration so that now I can confidently know what I'm good at, but probably more importantly, know what I'm bad at. I used to sell knives door to door as one of those MLL schemes, MLM schemes that I used to do. Sucked at it. Think I sold one knife and only one set to my parents. Think they still own it. Great knife. Great knife. Amazing knife. They'll cut through steel till the, till the roaches leave the earth. Like amazing <laughs> But I just wasn't a salesperson. So now when somebody's like, hey, I got this sales gig, all you got to do is MLM, MLM, MLM. I'm like, nope, I already know I suck at that because I sucked at my 20s. That's not what I'm good at. I can write, I can speak, I can produce, and I can execute my ass off. If you need someone to execute, I'm your boy. All that other stuff, I'm happy to introduce you to somebody. I'm, I've got a team, I've got contractors, I've got networkers, I've got masterminds, but these are the skills that I'm good at that I can monetize, that I want to do, and that can be profitable for me. I think understanding like what you're good at and you know that kind of helps you see like where your value comes from and I imagine that helped in these negotiations you're having with work we're trying to get that salary you know increases where you're showing them hey look what I'm bringing to you what look what I'm bringing to the table I don't know if that's something you could talk a little bit about like some of the tactics that you used that saw such success with getting your um, income raised over and over again from a salary perspective well, uh, yes, it, it got a little bit more refined over time. And, and that's why there's a second edition of the book, because uh, what I tell people is I know the things I'm good at because I know the things I suck at. So uh, some of the art is just finding the things to cut out. Um, really, a lot of those conversations came around like the uh, rich millionaire. And I think he's actually a billionaire said is I I had learned at 27 that negotiating my salary works. I did it poorly the first time. I didn't even really negotiate. I, I put I probably put out a low number. Uh, they probably think they got a deal. <laughs> and I was like, oh, but had I said nothing, because eventually I was on the hiring side of the table, I'd see people come in and they don't use a cost of living calculator. So I have a free video on my channel that's all about how to use a cost of living calculator. Uh, we, Cody and I talked about geo arbitrage and just how to use the moving across the country or possibly the world to your advantage to, to lower your expenses and use that to increase your salary. 
I learned that from failure at 27. So I started using that tactic and getting it better every single time. For example, when I moved to Texas, my, I learned later, uh, he's retired now. So I don't think he'll find, he'll care if I tell this story. When I moved, when I was coming back from Denver to Texas, I used my cost of living calculator now. And I saw that Texas was cheaper. I was like, oh man, I'm going to have to take a pay cut. And so I had a number in my mind. I was like, okay, if I take this pay cut, I'm still making the equivalent salary because Texas is about 30% cheaper than Colorado and the city of Denver. He didn't know that he matched my pay. So I came back to Denver or excuse me, came back to Texas. Uh, I think it was 90,000. Um, so I maintained my level of pay, but I'm in a cheaper state and no state tax. So I effectively got like a 40% raise. Like I was ecstatic. Me and my dad were like, yeah, we did it. Yeah, this is American dream. <laughs> Because he was preparing me like, oh, Marcus, you're probably going to have to take a pay cut. You know, it's Texas. They're going to they're gonna offer you, Lord. Like, we were really mentally prepared for this, but I wanted to get back home to the state of Texas. It was a celebration. And so learning the tools and systems so you don't get played in the game and then also learn how to use it, the game to, to, to succeed and win for you, too. So going back to entrepreneurship, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I love asking these types of questions. I actually saw a quote that you posted on Instagram, and it's just talking about kind of breaking down six figures – a, uh, a year into what you need to do a day. And I just thought this was such a, I don't know, just a, an enlightening kind of figure here. Cause a lot of people just see six figures, especially as an entrepreneur. It's not like you just have the salary and it's just this number that you kind of get and you get a biweekly paycheck or whatever. And just to give a, a couple examples here, it's a $5 service, 55 times a day, a $20 thing, 14 times a day, a $300 product once a day. And going back to you, when you first started kind of dabbling in this entrepreneurial world, you started freelance writing a bit. You started this podcast in 2016. It doesn't sound like either of those had a ton of legs when you first started. What made you kind of adopt this mindset and know that, you know, it, all it takes is starting with that like $5 thing and then that $10 thing. And it just keeps on compounding and building because a lot of people give up before they can hit these numbers and this figure that I'm reading from here. Well, some of it's personality, uh, but I think the better answer that people could use in Taylor's Your Lifestyle is I, I'm an auditor by day. Um, so I, I look at systems and data all along, uh, and I've been doing that for 20 years now. So going through a systematic approach, and that's what I tell a lot of people is that a lot of people have goals. They don't have a system. So, you know, they set like a New Year's resolution and they fail by February because they had no system in place. And technically, neither did I when, when I was 25 or so. I was like, I want to get out of debt. That, that was the declaration and that was the plan. Like, and I didn't know what it would look like, how much payments I was going to have to make or what timeline I was going to use. I didn't have any type of system. So I think a lot of people declare a goal because that feels good. Uh, that's why I go back to the execution. I realized I didn't even realize execution and systems was a skill set until really later in life when I saw how people were mismanaging it and, and they were just declaring goals because it feels good. So on the entrepreneur side, what is been fascinating in this latest venture because I'm, I'm getting to a point where you know, I'm like, I, it'd be nice to transition because I enjoy it so much. And like I said, uh, but now I need money from it. But what has happened is I've gotten to a point where my co previous coworker called them golden handcuffs, where I make so much money at the day job. It's actually more difficult to just replace it through pure entrepreneurship. And so I'm kind of like uh, sitting on this seesaw, like, okay, if I put my foot over here, I might have to start over lower, not really start over. Is it worth it with the hope that I'll scale up? And I'm doing this now at 39 and it's like, I can't really, if I was 29 or maybe even 19, I could really take that chance. I could just take this, oh, see what happens with this. But you have to take a much more pragmatic approach to it. But I know the math. I know exactly how many courses I need to sell. I know exactly how many clients I need to speak with. There's even some things I don't want to do. I, I could tell you how many Ubers I would need to drive. And like, I, I've gone through all the <laughs> reverberations of, cause I just call them multiple income streams. So what would my portfolio need to look like? I want to make, let's say six figures. And you just broke down the numbers. Like the math is the easy part, but then it becomes, okay, which of those things do I want to do? And then which of those things could I reasonably do going back to what I'm good at and what I'm bad at? Cause some aspect of that is there are things that I could, I mean, first of all, the easy answer is I just want a lot of money. And I'd like to do a lot, I had a lot of, a lot of money for one thing that I love to, to enjoy. A lot of people just, I want to get rich sleeping. You know, that's actually the ideal life. I actually don't want to do any work. <laughs> so until that point, till the money works for you, so to speak, I'm like, okay, what are all these 
income streams, what do they need to look like to get to what, whatever my goal is, whether it's six figures or second figures, and then how do I scale from there? <clears throat> I think one of the things that keeps coming back to me talking to you is just like the, the introspection, like understanding yourself, understanding what you are good at and what you're not good at. And Cody mentioned, you know, he loves to ask the questions about entrepreneurship because that's what he does. And there's a lot of people out there who I think hear stories about entrepreneurship and they get really intrigued by it. But is there something that they could do from an introspection standpoint to understand either they're not cut out for entrepreneurship at all or like to at least understand what kind of entrepreneurship they should get into? Um, I'll answer that and I'll, I think I'll quickly better answer Cody's question. And so the math of it, and you can write this down because I literally just did. There's 365 days in a year. Subtract how many days you want to take for vacation, divide that by 52 and divide that by 40. And that's how much you need to make every day. You know, you want to make six figures, you want to make 50,000, you want to make gross, you want to make net. If you want to put in taxes, take off 15% from that gross and then do that same math. So that's how you come up with the formula. Like I said, the math is easy. The math is always easy. As we talk about fire and financial, the math is always easy. For an entrepreneur, I would say the better way is to try it out. And I would say to fail safely. I remember, and it didn't really make sense when, to me when he said it, he, he owns a bookstore in Texas. Uh, he's a multimillionaire and he had came, he did a motivational speak um, to our group. He actually had our job and you have these motivational speakers come and they make you want to quit your job by the time they leave. I'm like, I don't know who they motivate. They motivate me to leave. But that being said, he said something like fail and fail often and fail fast because that's where all the answers are in the failure. And that's the thing that people try to avoid. And so I say to fail safely. And what I meant by that is, and it's kind of what I'm doing now is most of this I'm just doing on the side. Most of it's automated. Um, but even 10, 15 years, depending on the math that you use in the game, I, you know, I'm human. I still have that fear side. I'm like, what if I publish a book and nobody buys it? What if I put a podcast out and nobody downloads it? And so that's why I could kind of have that lackadaisical attitude of like, well, it didn't matter years before because, well, if no one downloads the podcast, I just take my into work. <laughs> It's pausing for, I'm seeing when this is a PG-15 audience. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it doesn't make any difference. But if I'm doing it full time, it does matter. It needs to be an X factor. Somebody does need to download that podcast. Someone does need to buy that book, uh, which is why I have multiple. But like I said, it'd be nice to just get paid for one. And so you kind of have to have the mentality of the failure can't stop you. Uh, and I haven't talked to a successful entrepreneur that hasn't failed yet. Do you have any failures in particular that you think have really shaped you into who you are as a person or an entrepreneur, whether that's a failed venture or a failed negotiation or whatever failure you want to bring up? Yeah, uh, I'll navigate it carefully. It's, it's actually technically still unraveling. Um, it was somewhat public. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I had a business venture with a business partner. I'm trying to keep this as technical and neutral as possible. And depending on how you look at it, it felt we went our separate ways. I can, I put it that way. And, uh, I think I said on another podcast, you, you, you never expect a, um, a, uh, you never expect a relationship to end with a cease and desist. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I didn't think it would, it would end in that way. So that really shaped my mindset. But after I unraveled through therapy and time, literal therapy, um, there was a lot of lessons that came out of that. Like I, I am, better protected. Uh, I write better legal contracts. I negotiate better. I approach relationships better. But what I've tried to do, even through my failures, and it, it takes a conscious effort, especially during a pandemic, because life is difficult and life is hard and life is long, is I'm trying not to become embittered. You know, you, you, you start to collect all the relationships that failed and all of the individuals that failed you and there maybe even whom you failed and, and the loss and like we're dealing with this pandemic and, and, and it starts to weigh, you know, like I said, you're sitting on that seesaw and it starts to weigh. And I think a lot of people, they just track the losses. But when I take a step back, which is why therapy is great. And I'm a therapy advocate. I have so many more wins. And I tend to remember the wins more like the failures start to kind of fade away over time, become a little bit more clear. See, like I was talking about when I was, you know, rock bottom, probably near tears at 22, I thought it was the end of the world and I'll never come back from this. And now I'm laughing at it and talking about it on podcasts. And I actually 
get paid to talk about it now. Um, and so kind of using that perspective, I, I try to, okay, you know, this too shall pass is a simple way to put it, but like from these failures, even in the midst of my next failure, what I now, what my, I think my mentor was trying to tell me, cause he was like 15 years older and I'm actually coming through this realization in real time right now is 24 hours. Like my recovery rate is about 24 hours. My bounce back. I'm actually frustrated by something right now. Um, but I, it's outside of my control. Um, and I know that I have failed before and survived, came out better. Maybe if I came out worse, but I came out more, more well around it. I may fail again, but it won't be that way. <clears throat> I think the one, another thing I keep noticing with, you know, talking to you is, you know, you learned a lot from failures as far as like kind of business entrepreneurship, but you also learned a lot of emotional intelligence. You learned a lot about yourself from that aspect. And I know you do some kind of inspirational uh, speakings. And I'm curious if there's somebody in, in our lives and the listeners lives who don't have a good relationship with money and they're trying to break through to them, they're trying to inspire them to kind of do better in that arena are there some ways that you would recommend them talking to them? Some, some of those emotional intelligence lessons, maybe that you've learned to break through that person, uh, you know, cause you obviously don't want to come across as like preachy and sometimes it's a touchy subject. Um, yes and no. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer it this way. I, I will, you know, I think that our generation's got a lot better about, you know, uh, being transparent with your privileges. I've been very fortunate that I have a father that is not only a mentor to me, he's literally a mentor and a pillar in the community, former professor, um, you know, has spoken and, and it still teaches and talks, has a degree in like sociology. So he was like m manipulating my mind. I told my people, the reason I lecture now is because I've been lectured all my life. I just didn't even realize it. So I, I recognize that. And then my, my mother and father have been together. Uh, they're they're going to kill me. They, they, they only tune into the podcast where I can't remember stuff. They're like, we've been together 39 years. I, I have no, I don't, I don't know why they think I could know this. I think it's 39 years, maybe 40. I'll say 40 to be safe. And so I, I've been fortunate to grow up in a household of stability. Uh, and you know, they've provided that pillar for me to reflect on. There's that. And I know a lot of people don't have that. So that's why I wanted to put that asterisk out there. However, if you don't have that, I think another thing that I've done well is I read a lot. I have refined my circle uh, and we've got a good group group chat that we keep going uh, with friends that I've had since high school now. And I didn't even realize that that was weird until we were out one time and like one of us was 30 because we're old now. One of us was like 35 or something like that. And it was like six of us who were just kind of sitting around and like somebody young walked up. They're like, man, it's so cool to see you group of old guys. We're like, 36. <laughs> just sitting there reflecting, man, I have no friends. And it's like, I've known these guys 16 years of my life, you know? So if you don't have those foundational people in your life, what I would say is again, and it sucks. And that's why I'm empathetic with it. If you don't have that, you, you've got to go out there and find it. You've got to, uh, as Cody knows, when, when you go to FinCon, we call when you find your niche It's the money nerds. You know, I didn't know these communities exist. And so I, I multiplied my abilities, a mastermind that I was talking about earlier, I found through FinCon. So even if I had not had these relationships, I, taking the responsibility on myself to surround myself with individuals. Your network is your net worth to see me succeed, see me level up and who I can ask these questions like, Hey, I see you're successful in real estate. That's something that I'm curious about getting in. You know, can we talk about that? That's a space that I should occupy. Hey, I see that you're a writer and they might ask me the same. Hey, I see you over here doing a podcast. And so, you know, feeding and bettering one another, find those individuals. And I'd say, keep it around five close ones that you can level up with people who want to see you do better and help you do better. And that there's our end here, but that's probably a whole podcast there. That's not always the same group that can help you do better. Um, sometimes and not in a bad way, you'll level up above your circle, your town, your network. You've, you've got to go find the next circle to help you level up and pull you up. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That is fantastic advice. Sometimes it's really hard to do that, but it seriously makes all the difference. This is coming out of left field, but I, I want to ask you about daily routine because you're someone who has a successful, you know, quote unquote, normal career. And you also have this like personal brand where you're doing a ton of exciting stuff like podcasts, like brand deals, like helping people and coaching. How do you juggle it all? What does a typical day in the life of Marcus Garrett look like? 
I don't want to. I didn't realize that it looks easier than it is. Uh, and, and actually, this was another mentor. Uh, he said that it always looks easy to the person who doesn't have to do it. So a lot of these things that I do, they naturally occurred to me. They're, they're, a lot of the things I do now, they're automated. Um, so for example, I, I have a, a blog that I need to write for 900 words uh, it's for Innovative Wealth. They just sent over the, uh, the, the outline for me. I could probably knock that out in 15 minutes. Cause I, I know how what the SEO is. I've, I've already, I like, I brainstorm it and I write in my head too, which I realized, was, I didn't realize was weird either. I can literally see the font size in my head, like all the head, like it's already written. So for, as soon as I sit down, it just downloads out of me. Cause going back to what I said earlier, I know that's a skill set that I'm good at speaking. I remember uh, one time we were building up for some conference and I, I think I hadn't even practiced and, and they were having like anxiety and a panic attack. They're like, oh, we got to do this. They're like, I ain't got to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> like, first of all, I'm talking about myself. Obviously, I can do that for 45 minutes. So, like, just wake me up when we're ready. Those are natural skill sets that I, I'm already good at because I, I've learned, um, you know, what I can and cannot do. Um, so, it, it's going to be like, for me, it's going back to that system. And I know the systems will succeed. And then coupled with, I'm not really afraid of failure, but I'm not even immune to it. Uh, I remember I, I still have to go through the, 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 the worry. Like I'll be walking to the stage like blank. I'm like, I forgot everything I'm going to say. I, I don't know what I'm going to, when I open my mouth, no words are going to come out, but I know that's the natural anxiety and panic of being a human being. But I know once I get the mic, cause I do it every single week. And even if I didn't, I just got to start talking and eventually I'll, I'll stumble into my groove. It's like, I, you got to go through it. You got to try it. And I, I don't know another answer, but I just know that I can do these things because I've done them before. Um, so I'll have to find a new challenge. And I think that this business is challenging me because of the amount of money I need to make. I, you know, I've, I've stumbled into not really lifestyle inflation, but to main, I, I can't go back to 19,600. You know, Chris Rock said, you can't go back in lifestyle. <laughs> If I could go back to 19,600, I moved to Huntsville, which is right down the street. <laughs> Get me a home down by the river. And like, you know, I really don't have to make that much of the podcast, but to maintain this six, seven lifestyle, it's like these things have got to do well. And so you can tailor the system to what you need to succeed. And so, you know, you've talked a lot about understanding these things that you're good at leaning into those strengths, but I'm sure you, you, you just mentioned like wanting to challenge yourself. So what is that next thing for you? Like what, what are you trying to do? That's making you a little uncomfortable that you're not sure if you're amazing at yet. So in full transparency, um, it'll be doing entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship full time. Like I haven't ever done it full time. It's always just kind of been something I've done on the side and I'm eager to, and I think I can succeed at it, but the transparent side being, um, I don't know if I can continue to serve two masters. And this is something I've been talking about or thinking about at least mentally for five years. Uh, but now I think I'm not, then I'm trying to, you know, dance, uh, accordingly, but I'm not sure I'm the only one that is thinking about this, uh, because part of my business coach, and I, I think it was a good thing, but we were like, we're going to put more of Marcus out there because there's the only way to find out it's the Marcus Garrett. That's literally my brand. If this can be a successful standalone brand to start putting it out there more and my coworkers follow me, my, my friends and family follow me. And while the brand has grown and is bigger than ever, and I'm making more money than ever, the eyes have grown too. And I'm not sure that all eyes want to see me succeed, not in this space anyway, or they might wonder why I'm succeeding in that way. And then whatever their conclusions might be for, for why that is occurring. So I don't know how, I think eventually there'll come a time I'll have to make a choice and I've already made it in my head. I've already had this conversation with my business coach, my father, mom, my gospel leader. <laughs> so I already know what the choice is going to be, but I think I want to be transparent with some people. Cause I know some people are thinking the same thing. Like, well, I can't do both. And I mean, technically you can, but you, yeah, you should probably face a reality where there may be a time that you have to make a choice and either know that it's better to make a choice that you make than to have a choice forced upon you. So I already know the choice that I'm going to make. Um, it, I, that timeline and when that choice comes might be closer uh, than I would have liked. But to answer your question, it, I, first of all, I don't think it will fail. 
I'll just immerse myself in this full time and then it can't fail. Love that. Like when you take the option to fail off the table, you'd be surprised what you will accomplish. Well, Marcus, we are definitely all rooting for you. And I think our audience is rooting for you as well. For those who want to follow along with your journey, I know you mentioned the book Debt Free or Die Trying a few times, which is recently remastered, remodeled in 2020. But you know, other than that, where are some of the best places for people to just kind of follow along and see what you're doing? Uh, I, I think most relatable to this is uh, my most popular webinar giveaway article and piece was how much debt can you afford on a thirty, fifty, or hundred thousand dollar salary? It talks about that cost of living calculator and breaks all that down. I give that away for free now, and that's at dmarcusgarrett.com slash salary. As far as the Marcus Garrett show, they can find wherever they're listening to this podcast. And we have now it's tailored to weekly entertaining conversations with your favorite influencers and entrepreneurs about life after debt. And like you said, I'm also on YouTube, universally branded under the Marcus Garrett. I'm not that difficult to find. It's the government. Name. <laughs> well, thank you, Marcus, for coming on the show and giving the audience uh, some little nuggets of wisdom. Thanks for having me.